Okay, here we are in Looking to the East. And we're looking from Honolulu. In Honolulu, it's 1 p.m. Um, but in fact, uh, we're talking to Japan. We're talking to Steve Zercher in Japan. And it's not 1 p.m. at all. It's the following day, Tuesday, in the morning. Steve, what time is it in Kobe, Japan? It is 8 a.m., so uh, at a bright and early start to be on this call today. <laughs> So we're a little bit ahead of you out here in Japan, and in some regards, certainly when it comes to time. It's yeah. Tuesday morning, 8 a.m. right now. Steve is a, a, a college professor in Kobe. He's also associated with the Scheidler College of Business here in Honolulu. And the, and the background photo, photograph we have for you today is the waterfront in Kobe. Um, that's where they have the, the cows that are fed beer. Have you been doing that? Have you been, um, have you been eating meat from cows and fed by beer? <laughs> Well, I tell you, uh, I have some interesting stories about that, Jake. Uh, you know, I'm a professor. I live on a professor's salary. And unfortunately, I can't afford uh, the Kobe beef. Oh, no. Because uh, it is quite expensive. It's probably cheaper in Hawaii than it is here in Japan. <laughs> interesting. But this is where they raise them. And um, it's off in the back country in the hillside, uh, back behind from the waterfront, the picture that you have up there. And that's a major industry for this prefecture, Hyogo and uh, something that they market quite intensively. And it's good. Well, I'll tell you, you know, have it when it's a special celebration. If you don't want to have the, the beef, you can just have the beer. You know, I know they have beer in Japan. I know that. Yeah. <laughs> they do, yeah, <laughs> indeed. Anyway, um, so tell us about your uh, teaching and uh, your school and what you're focusing in, in on these okay. days. Sure, yeah, I just started the semester. I teach at Kansai Gaidai University. Uh, that's in Hirakata, it's a uh, suburban community between Kyoto and Osaka. I've been teaching there for about eight years or so. And uh, I'm teaching an entrepreneurship class, uh, and I'm also teaching a marketing class. And I have one kind of side project. Uh, I don't know, Jay, if you're into uh, rugby at all, but the World Cup for Rugby will be starting in Japan in just a couple of weeks. Ah. And uh, I. I've set up an internship program for three of my students to be uh, journalists um, working uh, at the World Cup matches that are here. There's going to be eight in the Kansai region. Uh, they're going to be doing uh, interviews uh, of the players and then creating very simple quotes that will go out worldwide. So that's an interesting kind of one-time only class that I'm working on as well. Okay. And I that actually came about through a connection with I... uh, the American Chamber of Commerce, whom I'm associated with right. as well. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of the Chamber of Commerce, you, you've been active uh, and you've attended talks recently about the subject of our show, and that is uh, U.S. trade policy, trade negotiations in Japan. Can you tell us what's going on? Yeah, sure. So uh, as the vice president of the Kansai region, I'm able to attend periodic meetings uh, up in Tokyo with embassy personnel, and uh, we do kind of a briefing. The, the Chamber of Commerce in Japan works very collaboratively uh, with the embassy. I also do that uh, in the, with the Osaka Kobe Consulate. Um, so this was last week, and uh, the topic was just what's going on in general uh, in terms of new activities or interesting activities, so uh, focusing on Japan and a little bit more broader on Asia. So some of the things that um, uh, what we discussed is an upcoming visit by the Vice President, uh, uh, this is Vice President Pence, mm -hmm. and October 22nd is a national holiday, it's called Enthronement Day, uh, so that's the official ascension to Emperor uh, for the new Emperor. He actually has been in that role now for a number of months. Trump came out when uh, he first moved into the new Emperor role. But for this particular day, Pence will be coming out. Mm -hmm. We also have a bunch of governors that are here in Japan, mostly from the Midwest. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you can probably uh, understand why Midwest governors are interested in coming to Japan uh, because of the agricultural challenges that uh, the, they've been facing uh, with the kind of sticky negotiations that's been going on between the United States and China. Um, so so it, just as an, a, a background thing, uh, Japan sells manufactured goods like automobiles, especially automobiles, uh, to the U.S., and the U.S. sells agricultural product, products from the Midwest uh, to Japan. That, th th that's a big part of our trade relations yeah. with Japan, I guess. Yeah. That, that is correct, yeah. So autos is the number one export from Japan to the United States. 
by far, and then agriculture is a huge component of the exports that come from America to Japan. Mm -hmm. And that, that particular industry, especially in the Midwest, soybeans in particular, has been hammered. I think I read recently that the 10 to $12 billion in orders have been taken off the table by China in response to the tariffs that have been placed on Chinese goods coming into the United States by the administration. So they're all looking to Japan to try and um, increase their orders. And historically, Japan has protected its agricultural industry with uh, tariffs or uh, uh, with, uh, you know, taxes that are put on the products that come into Japan. Uh, for example, this doesn't apply so much to, to the United States, but for rice, mm -hmm. there's 800% tariff. So any rice that comes into Japan has to pay eight times tax on the price of the product. And the reason for that, of course, is that the rice industry and the farmers there have a very strong relationship with the uh, LDP, the Liberal Democratic Party, which is a party that's been in power most of the time since World War II. So they protect that particular industry. And that's true across a number of other agricultural products. There's pretty high tariffs. Again, this is not unusual. Many, many countries do that. America does it for sugar. And we, the senators from the South, where there's a sugar industry, have convinced the U.S. government to put up tariffs on sugar. So sugar that comes from Brazil and other locations mm -hmm. face that as well. Now, so, you, you mentioned that there was a certain... Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. So this leads to the, the negotiations that I'm sure you've read about uh, that's going on now between Japan and the United States. And it's on a fast track. In the United States, uh, Trump in particular, is pushing very hard to conclude a free trade agreement. That's a single agreement between America and Japan on several industrial and agricultural sectors. Uh, and if that is concluded, this will be a political victory for, the United, for, uh, for Trump in particular, and for the U.S. As, as well, and for the agricultural industry. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why the governors are here. They're probably meeting with the uh, Diet members, the congressmen members of Japan to try and pressure them to accept the terms and conditions that are being proposed by the United States. What are the terms and, and conditions, heard, Steve? Yeah. What are the terms and conditions? Well, we, I, I don't know specifically, but I think in general what uh, the United States is attempting to achieve, and here's, here's a little bit of irony as we talk about this, you remember the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP. This was a big push that uh, Obama had in the in the waiting days of his administration. Mm -hmm. uh, it had been a negotiation that had been going on for years involving 11 different countries uh, that are in kind of in the roughly in the Pacific area. It would include Japan, the United States, Singapore, Vietnam, and other countries as well. Well, when Trump became president, I think on the very first day, or maybe it was the second day, uh, he rescinded the United States' involvement in the TPP, saying it was a bad deal for the country. So what's going on, actually, is that this free trade agreement is achieving the levels that were in the TPP, basically. So the agricultural tariff reductions that were built into the TPP are the ones that are basically reflected in the free trade agreement that's being negotiated now. So basically, the United States is going to get back to where it would have been if it had entered into the TPP. So that's, I, I don't know the specific numbers, uh, what the reductions will be overall. Uh, that will be announced after the agreement is mm -hmm. in place. But it's but fair to say that the, these uh, tariffs you're talking about, the, the ones that be part of this bilateral trade agreement, are on both sides. They're tariffs imposed by the U.S. on goods coming into the U.S., and they're tariffs imposed by Japan on goods coming into Japan. Am I right? That was the case under the TPP. But under this negotiation, it seems like it's one-sided. And uh, it seems like Japan is conceding on agricultural tariffs. There's three areas uh, that are the focus for this free trade agreement. The first and foremost is agriculture. And then the second category is industrial goods. Mm -hmm. And there's, I, we don't really know specifically what that is. And the third one is digital trade. Mm. Those three areas. But from what I can pick up uh, from my sources and other information that I've been able to, to read online, uh, it looks like this is pretty much a one-sided concession. So I think Trump, is, Trump and Abe uh, have a pretty good working relationship. Abe was the first foreign 
leader to visit the United States, actually after Trump was elected, before he came president, it was sometime in November, like a couple weeks after the election, mm -hmm. Abe made his way out to um, probably to Trump Tower, I can't remember, but I'm sure the meeting was probably at one of Trump's properties, and uh, attempted to solidify the relationship and, and help to build a positive engagement with, with Trump in order to uh, smooth over trade frictions and so forth. Because Trump, as you remember, campaigned on these trade imbalances, uh, the, the chronic trade imbalances with Japan, China, and other countries, and that the United States was being taken advantage of. So I think uh, my speculation, this is my own speculation, is that Japan's under pretty intense pressure now by Trump to concede. And already internally, the domestic press, uh, the major newspapers are beginning to take a harsh look at how this deal is being structured and making, this, making the case that uh, Abe is conceding and it's a one-sided agreement. Mm. It may indeed turn out to be that way. So an example of that that's been in the press already is uh, one of the uh, products that the Chinese quotas is really hitting hard by the Chinese uh, uh, order uh, reduction is hitting hard as corn. And uh, part of this agreement, it's, it's leaked somehow, includes Japan increasing its orders in what, Jay? Corn. Okay. <laughs> and, wow. and Japan doesn't really... You know, it doesn't really, it's not, a, it's here, but it's not a staple. So uh, Abe is beginning to say, oh, there's been a pest infestation of the corn industry. It's a minuscule industry here in Japan, and we have to replenish the supplies that are being lost to uh, this, this uh, pest problem. So it's kind of a flimsy cover for the fact that more than likely Trump and his people are saying, hey, look, you, you need to help me with the corn farmers because I'm getting hit hard now by China. So order more corn. Yeah, so interesting. It's sort of a chain reaction. So Trump starts a trade war with yeah. China. Uh, China responds. Um, the, uh, the agricultural community in the Midwest uh, is, is, has no market in China, big market and lost. Um, right. And now, now a, lot of, uh, a lot of the farmers who supported Trump at the outset aren't supporting him anymore. In fact, a lot of farms are going bankrupt. Right. There have been a number of news stories about that. It's a one-way street bankruptcy. Okay, so Trump has a political right. problem on his hands, and he's taking money out of a, right. an already, um, you know, heavy deficit economy here, uh, and, he's, and he's giving these, um, you know, huge support payments to the farmers, huge billions of dollars of support payments, although it's, that's yep. irregular. That's what he's apparently doing. Okay, and then he's leaning on Japan to help him cope with the agricultural problem that he created by imposing tariffs on China. This is all to cover his, you know what. Yeah, and then the other point is that what he is getting now, he would have had two years ago if he had just gone forward with the TPP, which Abe was begging him to do. So when the U.S. withdrew from the TPP, Japan, to its credit, I was kind of surprised that they did this. They drove it forward. So it is now a signed and ratified agreement, and the, the 10 countries, the 10 remaining countries now are trading on this basis. So the United States uh, manufacturers and other industries are at a disadvantage now trading with these countries because those 10 countries have reduced their tariffs, and because the United States is outside of that, the uh, United States is still having to pay tariffs. Is Japan a member of the so, TPP? Uh, this is, is Japan, yeah, it is. They were a member, actually, yeah. That's yeah, very... Abe, Abe worked very closely with Japan to get them to be a part of this, and they, they uh, took it on and became a leader, actually, in, in closing it after the United States exited. Oh. That puts Japan in a, a funny position with the TPP. You mentioned before the show began that this... This all created tensions between Japan and the U.S. Can you talk about that? Well, uh, part of the negotiation style, and you can see uh, how it's operating when it comes to the negotiations with China, is uh, this threat to put tariffs using a, kind of an old, obscure law stating that uh, Chinese products or Japanese products are a security threat somehow to the United States. It's, it's pure fiction, but anyway, that's the statute or the loophole 
that Trump has used to enforce the tariffs on the Chinese goods that are coming in. He can do this unilaterally as the president. It doesn't have to go through any kind of legislation, legislative review. So he has mentioned, and he is still mentioning, just recently he mentioned, that he could potentially do this to Japan. Mm. And it would hit the auto industry. And that is the major industry in Japan, as you can imagine. Uh, if tariffs were put on Japanese autos being exported from Japan to the United States, uh, this would probably reduce the GDP by a significant amount, the Japanese GDP, and mm. push Japan. It's kind of teetering on going into a recession right now, but if that was to happen, Japan would definitely go into a recession. There's no question about it. So that's what's lingering in the background. And even though Abe has spent so much political capital, and there's a long historic positive relationship between Japan and the United States on a number of fronts, Trump, his negotiation style is to hold the, the big card, the big threat. And I, you know, it's still a possibility that, let's say the Japanese side all of a sudden at the last second says, no, we can't do this. The concessions on the agricultural side are too much, or we need more from you. We're going to have to wait. Uh, Trump could all of a sudden tweet out that, guess what, there's tariffs now on Japanese autos coming in. I mean, that's, that's the worst case scenario, but that's what's lingering in the background. And Trump is a part of his negotiation style, is leaving that open in order to drive this more or less one-sided free trade agreement mm -hmm. uh, through to completion. So that's kind of the, uh, the downside or the, the negotiation style that's going on in Japan. And of course, the Japanese government and the negotiators all know this, and the Japanese public to some extent knows this as well. You know, it's, it's interesting. There's, uh, there's so many moving parts to this. So in the U.S., um, car sales are low. Uh, car ads are everywhere yeah. on television and print. Um, they're, they're desperate to sell cars. And that includes Japanese cars, too, I might add. Um, but, but the fact is American car sales are low, um, and the automobile industry is suffering. A couple of other factors. Uh, that play into this, and I'd be interested in your thoughts to try to, you know, put, make sense of it. Um, yeah. The, the, the uh, yeah, Chinese so. are coming into the American supply chain. The Chinese, you know, as the Japanese did 10, 20 years ago, uh, creating assembly plants and the like, uh, you know, inside the U.S., well, the Chinese are doing that, too. They're in the uh, assembly, they're right. in the, in the uh, supply chain in the United States for parts right. for American cars. Uh, and you want, and they're paying one third the wages that the unions uh, were able to extract earlier. So the you know the whole car yeah. industry is under pressure. And finally, one other thing I want to throw in the mix for your cons consideration is that the automobile manufacturers are, um, I guess they're they they don't agree with Trump on the emission standards, and there's a kind of rebellion going right. on among them and some states uh, to hold on to Obama's em emission standards and to ignore Trump's uh, withdrawal right. reduction of the admission standards. So where does this fit in terms of yeah. pressure by American automobile manufacturers against Trump, okay, to force him to put tariffs on Japan cars? Okay, so that's a good question. And for uh, quite a while, autos exports to Japan were on the table. So well, Trump, when he's come here, he has made comments. He looks out on the roads and he doesn't see any American cars. And he says, what's, what's wrong? We have so many Japanese cars in America, and there's no American cars in Japan. Uh, and I, it's a long explanation. Uh, there's various perspectives on why that's the case. But the fact is, getting to your question, Jay, the U.S. auto industry doesn't really care about Japan any longer. Uh, there's two reasons. Uh, one, the, J the Japanese auto industry, the number of auto sales is shrinking dramatically. So this is a shrinking market. It's not a market that's a, a positive one at all. And uh, also, uh, maybe in the, in the past they had made a, an effort, but they weren't. Their particular products were just not popular uh, in Japan, American cars, and some there's some European cars like BMWs. Uh, oh, there's one American car, the Jeep. It's popular here. So there's a few exceptions, but overall, I think they recognize that the way they're producing cars and selling the cars to the American market didn't translate so well into success in, 
in Japan. Mm -hmm. So what I hear is that uh, the auto manufacturers don't want Trump to engage with Japan because they don't see it as a strategic market any longer. But Trump was continuing to push that up until recently. I guess somebody internally convinced him to take that off the table because it would be pure politics. The fact is that the, all of the major American auto manufacturers, they don't even have offices here in Japan. They, they've withdrawn completely. They're not in the ACCJ. You know, they're, they're not involved in trying to promote their products here any longer. They made that decision a number of years ago. So on that particular issue, on the trade issue, autos from export pers uh, perspective from the U.S. to Japan is kind of a non-issue, even though politically, uh, when Trump was campaigning and up until just recently, he would always bring that up as a point that Japan needs to open up its market. But the three areas, as I mentioned, that they're negotiating agriculture, some industrial goods, and digital trade, it does not include autos, as from, from what I've heard. Mm -hmm. your, your broader point about the auto industry, yeah, I don't know. There are young people, and it's not just Japan, but also in Europe, they don't want to drive. Mm -hmm. And they're not buying cars. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, they can Uber. Right. So the auto industry has some significant challenges. You're right. Uh, and I'm not surprised that in America, auto sales are also going down. Well, so is the millennials uh, like public transportation or alternatives to autos, and they like Uber? And Lyft, and um, yep. yeah, they're and they're turning their backs on the the you know traditional American American love of cars. It's a very interesting time. Yeah, you know, for me growing up in Texas, in my high school, you didn't have a car when you were a junior. You 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 weren't a man, right? So that's kind <laughs> of my his, my history. Because you, how how do you go out on a date if you don't have a car? <laughs> But uh, when I talk to my students now, they don't give a damn. They, they yeah. it's just a waste of money from their perspective. That's and it, yeah. you know, they, you're right. They, especially in Japan, the transportation systems here are just superb, and uh, they just prefer to use that and avoid the expense and maintenance of a car. Well, we have a few minutes left to talk about China, and I wonder what the discussion, um, you know, at your trade agreement meeting last week was about China, because. China is the 800 pounder, and yeah. it's right across the street, so to speak. And uh, you know, anything that happens in Japan mm -hmm. or Korea, certainly Taiwan and Hong Kong, ooh, Hong Kong, um, you know, uh, is affected yeah. by what China is doing. Right. Um, yeah, they, we did talk about about that a bit in our meetings. Um, so uh, there is a plan for President Xi to come to Japan in, around the cherry blossom season next year. So. Mm -hmm. Um, there's ongoing negotiations between Japan and China on a number of fronts, and it's uh, uh, that's good news that uh, the president of China will be coming to Japan at that time. Specifically, when it comes to the U.S.-China trade war, uh, there is no sign that it's going to end. Um, the negotiations that are uh, ongoing are not fruitful. They're not uh, producing good results. So. I think both countries now are hunkered down. Trump, as you know, placed even more higher tariffs on Chinese goods that are coming into the United States. Mm -hmm. And despite what he says about China paying for that, Jay, you're paying for that. I know. And all the American people are paying higher. I know. My so, and my tax uh, money is going to support the farmers who are going bankrupt in the Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is how it all plays out, unfortunately. But I... My own perspective is China, you know, they're shrewd, and uh, they, they have been running a trade uh, imbalance with the United States historically, as have Japan. Um, so this is hurting them in some respects, but they also know Trump may be not around, you know, after the next election, so they can play the long game on this and maybe just wait things out and negotiate this with the next president. Yeah. That well, may be a part of what they're doing. Hopefully they, they that will come soon. Perspective in it. You know, but I wanted to get to the this yeah. this this you know trade. Uh, sometimes I think Trump and maybe a lot of people uh, dissociate um, trade agreements or disagreements, as the case may be, uh, with geopolitical relations, uh, diplomatic relations. And my my last right. area of inquiry with you here today, Steve, is um, what effect do you see yeah. about the general relationship? of, um, you know, the people on the street, the diploma, diplomats, the government of Japan uh, with, with, um, with the United States. 
Because this, this kind of trade tension is not good for us. Um, uh, Japan has been no. our closest, most endeared ally in the region for, you know, since the war. Uh, so uh, we, right. we certainly don't want to undermine that, but somehow we are undermining it. And of course, the same, the same yep. question for China, you know, to the extent that um, it doesn't matter that, that Trump says that he's best buddies with Xi Jinping and they write love letters to each other. That really doesn't matter. The question is, how do the man on the street mm -hmm. feel about it? And how does the government in general in China mm -hmm. feel about its relationship with the U.S.? And when you put all that together uh, and, you, and you say that, uh, you know, to the extent that uh, Barack Obama wanted to pivot to Asia and spend more time and attention developing diplomatic ties with uh, all of Asia, um, that, that isn't, that isn't mm -hmm. the focus anymore. And in fact, um, I suggest, I'm interested in your thoughts on it, is that our relationship, our hegemony in, in Asia is declining every day here um, because you can't separate the trade mm -hmm. war with the diplomatic relations. What do you think? I, I totally agree. It, it's all integrated in terms of uh, political negotiations and popular perception and actual economic uh, outcomes. All of this is tied together. You know, in academia, I'm in that world. They like to separate different out disciplines and you know focus on economics only or politics only or uh, public communication. But in reality, all of these things are tied together. So to answer your question about Japan, you're you're absolutely right. There is a huge reservoir of goodwill uh, between Japan and the United States and the current leaders of the LDP. Uh, many of them have spent time in the United States, so there's a very very strong support for, for the U.S., but, you know, some of this phrase, like, for example, Trump's push on Iran, you know, Iran is a major source of oil. Japan is totally dependent on outside oil. Uh, they have no in, real internal uh, ways to develop energy. They had nuclear, but that's uh, after uh, Fukushima, that's been cut down quite a bit. So there's pressure on Japan by the United States to not import oil from Iran, but that affects the economy. So on the edges, you're right, there are beginning to be trade negotiations or political stances that are being pushed by the current administration, and it's having a negative impact on Japan, and therefore a negative impact on how Japan is viewing the United States. If I was to kind of summarize it, I think Abe has somewhat of a coping strategy. He's trying to do the best he can uh, with the current set of issues that he's facing because of the administration's perspective on trade and also specifically on, on Iran and trying to uh, isolate that country. Now China, um, now that one is maybe is a, a little bit more complex. I don't, there's not that reservoir of or historic uh, relationship that goes back to World War II between the two countries. Now China is the most important trading partner uh, for the United States are one of the most important trading partners for the United States, and, and uh, I mean, many industries are dependent on that. So there is uh, an expectation or a hope that uh, the trade will continue uh, and not be damaged too much. But if, if indeed these tariffs go on, and let's say Trump wins next time, and uh, it goes you know, on for years and years and years, and some economists are saying that once you get into this position, it's very hard to withdraw. Mm. And you know, you read you read about potential. You know, Cold War starting between uh, the United States and China. Uh, this economic friction and tension could lead to that, you know, maybe three or four years down the road. And mm -hmm. that's bad for China, that's bad for the United States, and that's bad for the world. Mm -hmm. And well, to your last point about the ascendancy uh, or the reputation of the United States, uh, it's it's been damaged you know, over the last couple of years, and we put our, we're putting ourselves in a weaker position. And China is ascendant. Uh, their economic growth is, is still four or five percent a year, which is much much bigger than the United States, and they have a very uh, focused uh, foreign relationship strategy to try and develop uh, strong ties with the developing world. You can look at Vietnam, or, or Thailand, or the Philippines. You know, all of these countries now have significant investments by China, and that's directed by the Chinese government. Mm -hmm. So, to that extent, China is trying to increase its influence economically and also politically. And with what we're doing right now, the United States has 
has tremendous influence still in the things of our military and our the history. Uh, we're beginning to put that at risk somewhat. Yeah. So it's, it's a, you know the, the crystal ball is cloudy. It, it, a lot depends on the election, I guess, next year, how the United States proceeds. But if Trump does win, um, then yeah, things could significantly change from from uh, Asia's perspective, looking at U.S. leadership and how how uh, qualified or how successful the U.S. could be in that role. The yeah, very role important. Very important. That World War II. We're out, of, we're out of time, Steve. We're going to have to leave, but uh, I would like to follow up uh, with you uh, very soon and uh, check on how these things evolve sure. in trade and in diplomatic relations also. Steve Zerker, and uh, Steve well, is an entrepreneur, much, professor here at uh, Scheidler and also in Kobe. Thank you so much.